I miss you. You probably wouldn't have missed the test today. Deborah. There's a test today? Oh, for the for them. Room. Yeah, they're they're still in, in mourning. Yeah, yeah, I heard about it. It wouldn't have been bad if I didn't have two other tests. Life is like bad. life is full. Wait till you're well, for those of you in nursing, wait till you're in nursing. They don't care. They don't care at all. My micro test is tomorrow. Oh good. And who you've got? Um Howard. Oh, okay. So you got Matt, yeah, Matt. Yeah. Dr. Matt, yeah. He's he's wonderful. Yeah. He's he's such a good guy. He is such a good guy. Very, very smart. All right, everybody, here we go. So let me, uh, so as I said, so if you have your scantrons, please just pop them in the front whenever you whenever you feel like it. Uh, there's a little pile over there, and we'll get started. I just, I just want to talk a little bit about blood vessels generically. We're going to look at a video of the heart, and uh, then we'll dissect the heart. I got a fresh supply of hearts. Uh, from uh, Mrs. Maurer, not related to Dr. Maurer, by the way. Just interesting to have the same last name. And because uh, she runs our labs. She used to do a lot of the micro labs, too. But now she wears other hats in administration. So long story short, let's begin. You'll find this PowerPoint here where it says week three. I, I mean, you have to, if you can't find them, give me a holler. I'll find them for you. But we are looking at 18A today and probably next week. Uh, we'll look at C again for the hard information. You'll, it's really useful here. This hard outline and blood vessel stuff. I think it is, is, is. I think it's particularly thorough. So let's begin. And it gives you an idea of what you're talking about. When you see that, you won't see it so much in the heart because we did the anatomy. But we'll look at the blood vessel. I don't think I'll get it over to C, but I loaded it anyway for the heck of it. Here we go. So. Effectively, that they, 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 obviously they deliver dynamic structure because they're flexible and they give, and that maybe is the most important thing to understand the structure. Because there's arteries are very muscular and hold their shape. Veins have muscularity depending on their side, but most importantly, they expand. And really, the way we look at them is they're called capacitance vessels. At any one time, two thirds of your blood is in your veins. I love veins because I did research with veins and I am interested in veins for a variety of reasons. But arteries, by definition, blood away from the heart with the exception of two. One that doesn't concern you so much at this point in time, the umbilical vessels, and the others, the pulmonary circulation. Remember, the only artery with venous blood, the pulmonary artery, the only veins with arterial blood, the pulmonary veins. Those are the oddballs. Capillaries are where the exchange with very, very limited areas where there's typical exchange that occur and veins obviously back to the heart with the aforementioned exception that are there. The other system, and we won't deal with that at all today, is like an ancillary or extra system that, that travels with the veins. But unlike arteries and veins, which are all connected, it's a closed circuit, so to speak. It starts in a blood vessel, it ends in a blood vessel, they go back to the heart. There's no openings from the periphery, as it were. The only thing that opens into the periphery are capillaries where exchange occurs. The lymphatic system, we deal with in another area. It's a very brief anatomical chapter. I know some of you are doing the A and P out of, somewhat out of sequence to my mind, but I, I don't want to get involved with that. And that's the lymphatic system. And the lymphatics are in because they're open at the ends here and they pick up heavy, thick, proteinaceous, fatty fluids, joints, we say a mile in there, okay, joints, okay, which basically consist of bacteria and viruses. So they're really important and they filter through a series of systems called lymph nodes that you and I call small glands when they get infected. And eventually they feed back into these large vessels because then the stuff the vessels are so big, they don't get clogged up. If they fed in down here, they would effectively clog them, for lack of a better way to express it. So the lumen is the hollow, and we're going to deal a lot now with hollow tubes. We, 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 you're going to get sick and tired of tubes. Respiratory tubes, 
blood vessel tubes, urinary tubes, genital urinary tubes. So the hollow opening, whether it's blood, whether it's urine, whether it's food, partially or totally digested, all travel through tubes in the hollow areas called the loop. So in almost all of them, the oddball is the gastrointestinal because it has a fourth layer because it, it, it wears a lot of hats in that regard because it's almost got a dedicated layer to the digestion and absorption. Everything else has three layers, just like we saw in the eye. You have something that's in close, intimate contact, if you will, as they call it the tunica intima. In blood vessels, it's simple squamous epithelium. I do this demonstration a zillion times. It's just taking like a marker and rolling it on a tabletop, nice and smooth. The fact that it's smooth means it doesn't hit structures. And when blood hits structures, blood cells jam up and they clot. And that's something we want to avoid. The big, so that's the same in all vessels, pretty much. The media, the mid layer is really where there are substantial differences. Muscular, sometimes elastic, sometimes a combination, certain amount of connective tissue, and typically thickest in arteries, where the externa is the connective tissue that gives it a certain degree of structural integrity, and that is located on the exterior. Please tell me I have sound on or I'm going to, I always forget. I have sound. Yay. I'm not so thick as I dumb I was. Okay. When we get to capillaries, what you're going to see, they are nothing more than a simple cell that basically has just rolled around and created a tube, maybe two or three of them. Okay, just like that. That's really what it is. It's really a capillary. It's nothing more than, for all intents and purposes, a single layer of cells that where several of them have formed a tube. Simple squamous cells. That's why things can move in and out so easily. There's not muscle or connective tissue or elastic tissue in there holding things together. Voila. Intimate contact. The technical name we give to it is endothelium. It is continuous with the endothelial lining of the heart, the same lining that covers the heart valves, same stuff, smooth, delicate things move over it. Slick, great word for it, reduces friction. Friction means clots. Underneath any lining tissue, there's a subendothelial layer, typically of loose, real or connective tissue, typically in larger vessels. When you, that one millimeter is kind of the transition in diameter between a vessel and a vessel with a suffix of the, that O-L-E or U-L-E, the diminutive suffix, arteries versus arterioles, ve veins versus venules. Okay, Dimin you don't want to do the whole routine, spaghetti, spaghetti, teeny, 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 teeny. You know, I do this for fun. Uh, the media, smooth muscle, and it's all smooth muscle, by the way. We touched on an A&P, and most of you had me. Sympathetic motor nerves, they control the diameter of blood vessels, either constricting or dilating, making them narrow, making them larger. Okay, bulkiest layer, for the most part, a little bit different in veins. Arteries, certainly the bulkiest. The externa. Sometimes called the adventitia, collagen fibers, reinforcing, anchoring. You have to have vessels that innervate the vessels, particularly the large ones. They've got a fancy name called vasa basorum. Nerves have one called vasa nervorum. And it's just the Latin for vessels feeding vessels, vessels feeding nerves. You'll see this a lot. That How do we know that that's a big, strong, elastic artery? You can look at that. That blue staining is elastic fibers. That's typical of the arteries that you'll be looking at today when you see the pulmonary artery in the aorta. They're called elastic or conductive arteries. That's that neat rebound from the elasticity. Veins inevitably don't have a distinctly circular or somewhat circular shape. They're sort of flattened because they have that expansile 
type of thing that's associated with them. And this is a great illustration that kind of compares the two. The intima, the lining is the lining. Okay, what's one big difference? Okay, they all have a subendothelial layer, some connective tissue. In arteries, particularly large ones, they have some elastic tissue. Already we're seeing elastic tissue. The media, smooth muscle and elastic fibers that you principally see mostly, and you can see the thickness in comparison of the artery muscular layer, and that's consistent. The more muscular layer and arteries, the tunica media is always proportionally thicker for similar than similar sized veins. And then and also yet another bit of elasticity. And finally, in the externa, collagen fibers, blood vessels, etc. Notice proportionally thicker in the veins. Then they proceed to get smaller, and this is a classic look at a typical capillary network or capillary bed that's there. And if you look closely at the illustration, typically there's some kind of basement membrane, some type of proteinaceous structure. And other than that, it's individual simple squamous cells. Slick, but most of those have the capability of exchange, meaning little openings that stuff can go through, particularly water-soluble stuff and water particles. This is another useful chart that gives you some ideas on the artery side. So it looks at the diameter, okay, versus, and you can see the diameter is getting smaller, but in each one of these, in that sort of pink color as compared to the elastic and that sort of a bluish color, the lining, the endothelium is the same. You always see more smooth muscle proportionally than anything else. Only time where you see it very, very close to each other in what are called elastic arteries. We'll get to those. Those are the ones that have the rebound phenomenon. And they play such a pivotal role because that's what allows our blood to circulate rather effortlessly throughout our system. I mean, it's not just high at the heart. That rebound phenomena allows the blood to circulate fairly efficiently and at a fairly constant rate all the way down wherever it's going on its journey. Is it going to an extremity? Is it going to an internal organ? Wherever. So you don't get... It sort of it limits the likelihood of what I would call turbulent flow. And that's a recurring feature. When things are turbulent, <coughs> things are slamming together. How many of you guys have done whitewater rafting down by the Yakagani? Okay. Or just watch the people doing that. I mean, it, <laughs> that's turbulence. That's changes in high to low rocks. It doesn't have to be maybe a foot or a few inches create turbulence versus then going to sandcastle and taking a trip on the lazy river. My kind of idea of white water. Just, just saying. Lovely beverage. I try to use Pittsburgh centric terms if possible. Without Ewan's Philadelphia was used. South is you all. I personally say you collectively. And lastly, what's interesting, you can see the size. One and a half centimeters, slightly more than a half an inch. Six millimeters, that's about a quarter of an inch. That's a muscular artery. Most of the named arteries where you're taking a pulse, like here, typically the radial pulse, in that area, they predominate with muscle, and they are what we call distributing vessels. They make sure the blood gets where it's going. And then lastly, arterioles. And notice, we're down to micrometers, okay? And what's interesting there, that's where there's enough muscle that it can squeeze that lumen shut. It, there's enough muscle that it can overpower it and effectively close it. To try to close a big artery like a muscular artery, a radial artery or a femoral artery, you have to use a tourniquet. In surgery, we use what's called a pneumatic tourniquet. 
we inflate a tourniquet in the upper extremity of 250 to 350 millimeters of mercury, and the lower extremity between 350 and 500. And I've used a ton of them. So it takes some power to overcome them. That's why arterioles are important because that's where your blood pressure is mostly controlled. That's a very important take home point. That's where we see the pressure. So that's what we're looking at. It's the arterioles. They're the ones that we can, where the, where the degree of contraction or dilation can impact blood pressure. Veins, not so much. You have capillaries, you have veins, what they call venules, which are, again, relatively a little bit wider than respective arteries for the most part. Notice consistently in veins and venules or even in veins, the predominance layer is the external layer. That's because they can expand and not burst. You've all seen that. Anytime you've seen, you've, almost everybody's had blood taken out of them. They put some kind of a tourniquet over there and do a blood <coughs> test. What happens? What they do is they put a tourniquet, lightly, relatively speaking, to stop venous return, have you exercise a little bit to pump, and the, and the veins fill out, they distend, so it makes them easy to venipuncture. And it's not, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Despite having done surgery, I'm kind of all thumbs. So elastic muscular versus arterial. Elastic, conducting vessels, conducting blood from the heart to the medium vessels. Elastic in all three areas. Smooth muscle, but inactive in vasoconstriction means they don't, your diameter doesn't get smaller. It just stretches and pressure reservoir is a good way to describe it. Continuous blood flow downstream, even when the heart is at rest for that three quarters of a second, roughly, that the heart's not beating, for most of us, okay, it still allows that rebound phenomena helps to conduct the blood flow. Distributing or muscular, most of the named arteries, the conductive arteries are things like the aorta, the carotid arteries, the subclavian arteries, the pulmonary artery, they're big arteries. All the other ones that have names are muscular or distributing arteries. From the largest would be about the size of your pinky to about the size of a pencil length. Okay. The tunica media with more smooth muscle lasts elasticity. Okay, there is a, there certainly is elastic tissue there. They do redirect blood flow. They vasoconstrict where the arterioles and the interesting thing is because it's a closed system, they keep getting more and more. So you got proportionately a vast number compared comparatively of arterioles okay all three tunics okay control blood flow into the capillary beds we call them resistance arteries because we can change the diameter to really resist flow and limit it going into those capillary beds that's the beauty of it which brings us lastly to what they lead into capillaries so small, only a single red blood cell can pass through at the time. The great thing about red blood cells, and you'll learn about this when you do the blood unit, is the red blood cells have, are aided by certain proteins that allows those red cells to kind of bend and fold a little bit without clotting so they can slip through the cracks. They can get around corners. They can get around bends. That's the beauty of red cells. Most of those are, uh, there's a lot of medicines today that are utilized for people who have had clots that are less problematic than in the old days where they caused greater problems. You're still going to encounter people who in a hospital intravenously you administer heparin and you use things called heparin locks that are indwelling catheters. And then on the other hand, a lot of people outpatient for years, they use what are called Coumadin compounds or warfarin compounds, they have to be monitored pretty closely. There's, it's a lot, it's a certain amount of too much or not enough when it comes to, you don't want somebody to clot when they shouldn't clot or not clot when they should clot. So there's a fine line between them. They're stabilized, these capillaries, by other cells, and they're everywhere except 
There's no direct blood flow to cartilage. You might remember from AP1. Epithelia gets it indirectly through diffusion, the cornea and the lens of the eye. Any of their nutritional needs or waste product removal is sort of serviced indirectly by diffusion. Okay, so gases, nutrients, waste, that's what goes in and out of capillaries. And they're held together. And this is where we see a combination of gaps that allow liquids to pass through them. Nearly all the capillary beds, skin, muscle, lungs, even in the central nervous system, okay, with the brain being unique because of the blood-brain barrier, are called continuous capillaries. And I've been using this analogy, I don't know, for the last 20 years or more. Okay, it's like when you hold your hands like this. If you're a little kid and you don't have a cup and there's a, there's a spigot or something you want to get a drink out of. Okay, that basically holds water. Some of it's going to leak out because there are little clefts in there. You can't really see them, but they're there. That's based on the number of these tight junctions. When? So you can see them here. There are the clefts. Okay. You could, they can be modified by certain things. When you get an infection or an injury, these exterior cells will open the clefts a little bit more. So white blood cells can come to the party and start to heal you. That's part of what you learn about when you talk about the immune system and the process of inflammation that are there. The distinctive area is two, the brain and then the male and the testicular capillaries. Sperm cells are produced when you're at puberty, your body does not recognize them as self. So if there was an injury in the testicular area, it's called the blood testicular barrier. Your body would attack them immunologically like an invader. Other than that, in the brain, it's very restrictive. It has a ton of these tight junctions that make that watertight. And then it's covered by glial cells. You might remember they're called astrocytes. When you get to the kidney and in some glands, you get these fenestrated capillaries. Now, if you use that same analogy, you have little openings that are visible. A fenestration is a hole, a perforation, a window. In surgery, we use what are called fenestrated drapes. That's a sterile towel. It's got a hole in it. Like you put it over your knee because you're going to do an arthroscopy in the knee. And you hold it with some towel clamps and now you have a sterile barrier. It's there. So fenestration, active filtration, the kidneys, intestines with absorption, hormonal secretion, more permeability, usually have some type of a membrane around. You can see the little holes. Those are the fenestration. And again, at signals, they can open and be a little more of them or less. And lastly, principally in the liver, sometimes in the bone marrow or in the spleen, a little more sluggish blood flow big gaps. These are called sinusoidal capillaries. So it's, it's designed for larger particles. When you eat, the blood is taken back by a very specific system called the hepatic portal system or the hepatic portal vein that we'll cover, not today. Takes the blood back and that blood is richly laden with stuff that you ate to even invaders. So where's its first step? Not into the general circulation. It's got to make its way through the liver. And the liver can process it. It can clean it up. It can partially process it. It can start to work on some of the nutrients that are there, deal with invaders, detoxify toxins. That's what the liver does. Job one, so, and then it makes its way back into the inferior vena cava. And you'll learn about that pathway. It goes through the hepatic portal vein into the liver and then into the hepatic vein and then, then into the inferior vena cava. So you got big openings that are there. Okay. And capillaries are between the small arteries and the small veins. Okay. They branch and that's where the exchange occurs. So it goes from arterials to, our, to arteries to arterials, finally to the terminal or the end arterial opening into the capillary bed. And then after it goes to the capillaries, it's picked up by a, what's called a post-capillary venule, or as our British friends would say, capillary. They're always accenting the wrong syllable. 
Yeah. Like we had, we advertised, they had adver advertise, you know, aluminum, just aluminum. Just saying. So I, I'm addicted to British crime shows. Addicted. Watch them constantly. So local chemicals regulate them. We're not going to get into the regulation. And they shunt blood when needed. And this is typical. Okay. You have, it's either open or closed. If the arterial, the terminal arterial is open, it goes through the bed. If it doesn't, it bypasses it. It's still going to make its way back into the veins. There's a number of different kinds of bypasses. But when you're exercising, okay, you're going to bypass that because your gut your genital urinary system doesn't need blood supply. It's going to redirect it to capillaries in skeletal muscle. Your body has that capability. There's a variety of shunts. This one's interesting. It's called a meta arterial or a thoroughfare channel. And it has a very unique little bit of muscle, smooth muscle that surrounds it called a precapillary sphincter. Sphincters open and closed. They're like doorways. And so here you can see them. When they're closed, the blood goes directly from the arterial, bypassing the exchange into the venule. When it's open, and they don't show it, they show it open, then it'll go through all these vessels. So again, it's because that smooth muscle is sufficiently strong to block off passage. That's what it's all about. It's just kind of neatly arranged where we can allow blood flow in some areas, we can easily control it. And that's the beauty of the way the human body works, I think. Veins bring everything back. Inevitably, there's, and I told you about this before, there's usually a couple of veins per artery. Okay? So that typically they travel in pairs. They're called vena comitantes. Okay? And even, in, for instance, in, it's interesting, in what they used to do, and probably they still do it today, when, when there's an arm or a leg that's sharply severed and you try to replant it, okay, tying the arteries together is relatively easy. They usually put two, not just two veins, three, four veins per artery. It, understand that that's where the compromise is usually venous return, not so much arterial blood flow. And I learned about, I learned about this 45 years ago. When it was really in its infancy, we had a team, and not in our hospital, our hospital, we were allied, which is now part of Drexel University Medical Center in Philadelphia, Drexel University Medical School. It was Hahnemann Hospital, which was, was a hospital on uh, 14th and Vine, Broad and Vine Street down, if you're familiar with all with Philadelphia. And it's not there now, per se. I'm sure it's just a, you know, just an extension of Drexel, but that's where we used to send our stuff because they had surgeon who could replant those things that was their specialty it was very interesting okay so the veins and all your veins come together so a network of vein from this finger this finger this finger they all are coming to a little archway here leading into a large vein coming up the thumb side and a large vein coming up the pinky side so they have veins really function with are a lot of tributaries going to a central location, not unlike multiple, multiple rivers leading into whether it's the Mississippi or the Ohio, you know, all think of all the, the, the rivers and streams that make up the Allegheny and the, from the Yacht to the Mon. And then and I'm, I'm trying to Pittsburgh centric. The confluence. You know, the point, all that, help me. So, that's part of the deal as well. So, when venials converge, have all of tunics, thinner walls, large lumens, large openings compared to the corresponding arteries. The media is thinner, but the externa is thick. So, they have the allowance of capacitance. And I can't say it enough. At any one time, about two-thirds of your blood supply are in veins. We all think about arteries, the vast amount we've got. It, it's, it's all about venous return. You saw that illustration. So in the systemic veins and venules, 60%. In the arteries, 
In the lung, the pulmonary blood vessels, 12%, in the heart, 8%, and the capillaries, 5%. So it's a tremendous predominance, four times as much in veins than in arteries, if you want to look at all of those different systems that are there. So we underestimate their importance. What do they have? And we'll see that again. They have valves because they don't have the muscularity of the elasticity. So they have to rely on gravity and, in or and muscular activity externally. You walking, you standing, you breathing to be able to return that blood to your heart. To fight gravity, there's a system of valves, not unlike the valves in the heart with those same kind of cup-shaped leaflets, except they point toward the heart, the openings of the cup. So whether when you stop walking, let's say, the cups come together. And so we effectively, every time we move, the blood gets pumped back to the heart. And there's a variety of other means where this occurs. There are a lot of areas in the brain for one and your calves for another, where there are a lot of veins that have relatively thin walls, okay? And we talked about one in the heart called the coronary sinus. Those are areas where blood can pool. The very large ones in your calves are so, it's even if somebody's bent, where you can just, maybe you've seen it. If any of you worked in the hospital, and I'm not doing, I'm not doing this because I'm lazy, but I am, is they put on what I like to call squeezers. Look, they put on special kinds of hose called T.E. Ted hose, which stand for thromboembolic disease, because somebody's stuck in bed for a long time, their blood will clot. So they put that on and they put intermittent compression devices that squeeze their calves, their ankles and their calves to assist the flow of blood to prevent blood clots. People die from blood clots when they're bedridden for a long period of time. They end up getting lodged in their lungs. They're called a pulmonary embolism and they're immediately like. So I, I always like to call them squeezers sort of like they're hugging, they hug your legs for 20 seconds and they release, 40 seconds and they hug them again, for, and you, can, you can set them for periods of time. Now I've had them on when I had to be in the hospital for, for a long period of time, post-operative. This was a number, this is more than 20 years ago. Yeah, actually we have a set at home. My wife got me, that's what I get for presents. Do I get a new set of golf clubs? No. Oh, you can have this for your legs. Like she'll probably give me a new lawnmower next year. What is the, what's the hidden message for that? Just saying, we saw these illustrations before. And so we'll talk about these a little bit more. People are prone to these. Hereditarily, post-pregnancy, intra-pregnancy, associated with obesity and, and prolonged standing. Those of you who would endeavor to go into the nursing profession or health careers, Guess what you do a lot of? You stand. Just saying. So weakening the valves affect more than that's roughly one out of six of us are affected. And then there's other things that are associated with it. Hemorrhoids are really a variation on that particular theme. These are channels that where they anastomoses, we talked about them in the heart. They are in the arteries and in the veins, the coronary arteries and the cardiac veins. So they're, the beauty of them is they allow alternative passageways to flow. It's like inherent detours that we have to, to bypass areas where, and still get, we still get blood flow there. How'd you like that? All right, let's go to the, let's go to the videotape. So we're gonna go to this animation and I will send you the link for it if you'd like to see it again. Okay, and this is, it may be inappropriate for some years. And I, I have to see if it will be on. We have to adjust the sound here. No guarantee. There's two of these, this is the second. They're from like some community college in South Dakota. Dakota State.
Ours are a little already protected more than that. Yeah, you'll see that they're not big and they sometimes they're more squishy. A little hard to tell. Like they're doing, you can use it. And what you see is that. You'll know the difference between right and left because there's a certain similarity. Is the muscular layer is not nearly as the, the left ventricle is significantly thicker. And there you're beginning to see cord tendony. These are the flaps of the valves themselves. You just make out those are a little bit of the edges of pectinate muscles. That's a papillary muscle that's there. So you'll be able to see all those things with these hearts. It's a question whether you get a good one or not, but, but moving on.
That's what I mean. You can see that cup like sort of appearance. That's a good way to do it. If you stir the probe, you can see where it comes out here. That up there would be the harmonic valve. Let's do oracles. I mean by pectinate muscles, those ridges. See how the thickness comparably there. Awesome.
Because you, you could cut through and see, probably get all the way up to the back. See what they're doing. Tried to do a bunch of takes till they got really good hearts to do this to demonstrate. So I, I, I've been showing that for a long time. It's really very good. So they ordered a bunch of extra hearts for us. The key issue typically is to hide it. Um, as usual, we have gloves back there. This one's more amenable to scissors by the diagram. I always think the hardest part how to help you is is to get the orientation of the heart. So, again, if you try to bridge them along. So by and large, I mean, I've always found that the oracles were sort of the secret to this. So in something like this, typically, Looking at the orientation this way, this is probably the left oracle, and typically the right oracle is a little bit more on the exterior aspect. At least the way these are packed, it's just like this. And then you can adapt accordingly. So, I mean, there's plenty of parts here. So I pop it out of the plastic, just cut it out, rinse up, and then identify as many structures as you possibly can. You know, so, you feel the effect of you all the chambers, as many of the valves as possible. The papillary muscles, but the uh, corded tendon. You're going to see sort of the, how elaborate the chambers are, what they call the vector carne. Because they are in the same bottom, even though the right looks much more, it doesn't have nearly as much muscularity, but the reality is the volume is the So, and that's where we're going to start with that. I'm going to get these out of the way. I'll be happy to come around and help look at it. And the only need to read is a paragraph, like a reflection paragraph or two, um, which you saw. And you know, you should send it electronically, as many as you have. Okay. Good to go. Let's get started. I will out of this.